We're doing all right. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Been busy. Hey, man, that's good. Well, you you know, it's good to be busy rather than sitting around petting a cat on a sofa wondering what is the meaning of life. So, oh, you yeah. know, I, I suppose. So tell yeah. me about the avophatic subject, because it's really funny you bring that up, because I wrote like after our talk last week and we were talking about like Dolly leaving there to be like where it doesn't seem like there's anything essentially human. I've been thinking a lot about this idea of what if the essential human element is a kind of nothingness that we then have to choose if it's apophatic or a signification of insignificance. You know, if the human is ultimately something apophatic, which is funny because I think that would tie a bit into Zizek, but also kind of the Trey's work on the notion of is it evidence of the fall or is it evidence of an essential negativity? It's almost like we have to choose. But I want to hear your thoughts on that because I know you would mention that to Michelle because I, I think there, I think it's a very interesting line of thought. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's also a little bit of a playoff of Boober too, um, mm. <clears throat> where he talks about like the whole notion of like God is dead. Right. Mm. Um, and he sort of inverts the argument by saying it's our fault. We're, we're the ones that are turned away. <laughs> right. Um, so I, I thought it would be interesting. What if we inverted the you know, the whole idea of like apophatic God, right? Mm. The fact that we can't know God, but nobody takes it from the point of like, it almost seems like when we say there's an apophatic God that we take the point of the subject, but I actually felt like that, that, that we're not actually doing that. Mm. <laughs> you know, why is it that we can't know? Um, but I think, and it, and I started entertaining the idea and I talked to Trey about this the other day. Chitan. <laughs> yeah i talked to trey about this the other day and i was like you know what if what if the subject is negativity right what if we just say that you know um because then if it is then there is no apophatic god it's actually the subject that is apophatic <laughs> we we can't affirm anything that's the problem it's not that we can't affirm anything about god we can't affirm anything mm. um <clears throat> we're the negativity uh <laughs> and uh, trey basically said like oh yeah this is basically like zizek's point right mm -hmm. um and what i think basically yeah yeah so i said i said well what if it's like uh trey was saying he doesn't he discourages my use of the term negativity because it does sound a little too much like z um i was saying like what if the adam and eve thing right the whole premise of like adam and eve was actually they're not supposed to do anything <laughs> they already were good right so that's why i started entertaining the idea of like them being like subjects being a negativity because if you were to do something you actually go into like using your term in a facing negation right mm -hmm. um right it's like a uh you, you start, you, if you're a negativity trying to withdraw into yourself, you sort of fail, right? It's always going to fall apart. It doesn't make any sense. It's an impossibility. Um, so I, I told Trey last night, I was like, what if it's a pure negativity, such a pure negativity that it's a fullness, that that's the reason why you were never supposed to do anything in the first place? Of course, the debate comes down whether this fall was necessary and so on. But, I mean, we're already here. So I'm like... <laughs> For me, it's a little bit too late. Right? <laughs> so, what about debating that? I don't know, but yeah, that's just kind of like what I got, uh, Daniel. Well, 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 that's fantastic. First off, Chitan, wonderful to see you, sir. I think you had a haircut. It looks really good. I'm really looking forward yeah. to your talk with Cadell <laughs> on Enter the Alien. That looks magnificent. Uh, Mr. Fishman, always a pleasure. Zach, hi, Rude, Andrew Luber, excellent to see all you people. Thank you for being here. Last week we had a fascinating discussion. We had Dolly. We talked about Mr. Ebert's work on the notion of the point of kind of infinity is also nothingness because it's ultimate saturation. And it's interesting then because that kind of suggests infinity if we use that word. And I know that's a loaded word, but if you grant it to me, uh, it's kind of like a Schrodinger's cat, right? Like the same experience of nothing for Mr. Ebert is also an experience of everything because, you know, and he, he referenced uh, thermodynamics and saying if energy cannot be destroyed, then there cannot be nothing in any meaningful sense that is like the like meaning truly nothing. 
right? If nothing is meaningful, it must mean like an oversaturation of relations or infinity. That's very interesting because then we were, for me, we were talking about Dali and we kind of were positing this kind of notion. And, and this was also in the context of a case study for the overall meta crisis that we had been describing. And it's interesting with Dali that imagine you had a, um, and this is, I guess, what I was thinking about, which ties into what Javier was saying, and then I'll pass it on to whoever likes to speak. Imagine a world where you had an art gallery that, that was entirely a result of the Dali uh, technology that created this AI um, paintings. And you didn't know they were um, done by Dali and you actually couldn't tell that they were done by Dali. So the human element would be completely removed from the gallery and yet you wouldn't be able to tell that the human element was entirely removed from the gallery. You understand what I'm saying? At that point, what's interesting to me is what makes us essentially human almost is a kind of nothingness, right? Because AI at that point is entirely able to reproduce what is human without humans being involved. And it's interesting to think that precisely at that point, which seems to be what AI and technology and all the game theory dynamics is leading to, we as humans will have to choose if the very fact that the essential human element cannot be located, say, in the universe is evidence that that human element is a nothingness that is apophatic, as in it's like totally full and cannot be like put in the universe. And that's actually evidence of kind of our greatness in a sense, although that's a loaded term. Or if it's a nothingness, that's evidence of our insignificance because an AI can replace us. So it's interesting to think precisely at that point where you have such a gallery that would theoretically unveil that the essential human element is a nothingness that we then would have to choose if that nothingness is evidence of something apophatic, you know, like in a theological sense, or evidence of an insignificance. Um, evidence that human beings, you know, if you use like a Christian theolo theological language, evidence that humans are in the world, but not of it, or evidence that humans are not consequential for the world because AI could easily replace us. And it's very interesting to think that the ability to choose um, human, the essential human element of nothingness as apophatic might require a lot of the things we've discussing, like absolute knowing, rising to the occasion of the overman, being able to kind of be philosophically trained. And then that would tie into the question of, can you spread those conditions so that more people could pick that experience of the essential element of human beings being nothingness is apophatic versus insignificant. And then the question would come, and then I'll pass it on to whoever wants to speak. Um, then the question would become, is the ability to make that pick and to think of nothingness as evidence of an apathetic dimension of human beings precisely, a, would that instigate a change of thinking that would help us avoid all of the dynamics of the meta crisis, help us avoid ending up in an episode of Black Mirror, help us avoid ending up in a, a Kafka story. Um, and how, if that is ultimately kind of what technology is going to lead us to, where we're ultimately going to have to make what I want to almost call the final absolute choice in reference to the paper, to the enter the alien uh, anthology that Chichan is a part of and we'll be talking about at two o'clock on Mr. Cadell Last's uh, channel, looking forward to that where the absolute choice is the ability to identify with a radical otherness, something that is alien, if you will, other, you know, that movement where they all talk about them self-consciousness to reason. There's nothing, it's hard to think of something, identifying with something more other than identifying with an apathetic nothingness and how that's almost like the final absolute choice. And is that ultimately what, say, if Andrew Luber, we talked about the call of being, if ultimately answering the call of being is the ability to make, that final absolute choice, if the ability to say rise to the occasion of, of absolute knowing is the ability to make that ab absolute for choice, and if that's playing an integral role in sort of overcoming the meta crisis and things like that. So it's something I spent the whole week after last week's conversation thinking about all that, and I appreciate everyone being here. So, and it's funny because Mr. Javier Rivera, we were just talking about, had been thinking about the apophatic subject and what would that mean? And I think it kind of ties in a little bit to Zizek's wired brain in different things like that. Thank you, thank you for having us again. Hello, everybody. Um, in relation to what you're talking about in terms of like, if there's an art gallery where everything is made by AI, but we don't know it's made by AI. First of all, are we being told that it's made by a human being? Like, this is kind of my, this is what I brought up last time, is that to me, the human element is relational, right? So it's not like, it's it's a no thing. And, and like, it doesn't have any substance, but it's it's, like it has a metaphysical reality. You know what I mean? It's like, what is a relationship? A relationship is not, there's no substance to it. You can't, there's no atoms 
there, but like if there's you and me, and then there's the relationship, that relationship has some sort of reality to it. You know what I mean? Um, it's a, again, it's a metaphysical reality, but it's still, it's still ontologically real. It's still a, a historical force, right? It still has causal power. Um, and so to me, the human element has to do with how we relate to the image in relation to the artist that created it, as opposed to how do we relate to the image in relation to an AI that created it. There's two different relations going on there. So if we're, if we're being told that it was created by a human and they're, they're making up a story, then we're asking a different question as to like, does, you know, what does it matter if this is really Jimi Hendrix guitar or it's just a, a replica that's, that's exactly the same? Um, that's a different question than, than asking what is the difference between Jimi Hendrix guitar and another guitar that is not Jimi Hendrix guitar. Nobody's pretending that it is, but is, is the same guitar, right? Those to me are two different questions. And I think the, the latter question is, is more relevant and more important is like the reason why Jimi Hendrix guitar is worth millions of dollars, whereas a, a new guitar off the assembly line that's materially the same isn't, is because of the relation that we have to Jimi Hendrix, right? Um, so, so that's, that's where I would go with that. I don't know. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm answering the right question here, but that's, that's what comes to mind for me. I think that's a wonderful question and I'll pass it on to Mr. Andrew Luber. Mr. Luber, good to see you today, sir. Good to see you too. I uh, just wanted to say, uh, net 11's discussion was fantastic. I, I wish I could have listened into it on, in real time. I, I really liked Zach, your, um, the guide. I, I love that. Um, definitely resonated with me um but with regard to the art gallery uh hypothetical in my, in my opinion in that world we wouldn't consider that art anymore we wouldn't consider um a painting in that in those parameters how we traditionally understand a painting to be art in that world art would be something different because I completely agree with the metaphysical no thingness space. To me, I call that theme, essentially. And like the theme, the AI, no matter what, has to adhere to some theme in order to create the piece of art, just like a human being. Like, and like uh, the painting will tell a story of its own, just like a human being will tell a story of its own with, with the painting. So to me, the, the, the art is basically where that emanation and the, and the eminence meet. So it's like that realization of the real that uh, Daniel said in the last discussion, um, that, that point is where the art does its work. So, and no matter what, why, why I like Heidegger so much, Dasein, he, does, he never explicitly says it's like a human being, per se, but a human being dwells in Dasein. So to me, that's like other beings, so to speak, could be dwelling in Dasein other than human beings, is, is how I interpret that. So I, I just think um, where art takes place is in Dasein. And AI, artificial intelligence, could be capable of, of doing art just like a human being in Dasein. So in that sense, like, to human beings, art would be something that's unique to our particular, like, phenomenological perspective. And that's why art would be different in that world. It would be a different, something only humans could do. Something that only comes from the human perspective. So... Yeah, I'll just sort of, uh, sort of uh, say something in a very uh, small kind of a way, but the, the, the problem with art actually is, and this is why it's interesting, become interesting in the context of AI, uh, art generally sort of correspond to the creative element of the human being. You know, if, if, you, if you look at two forms of uh, correlation between an external reality subject can have, one is creativity, the other is calculation. You know, you can you can you can calculate what already exists, and you can find new ways of bringing what 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 existing uh, structures you have. You know, art generally corresponds to the creative element. If there is no creative element, you may create art through that calculation also. That's not the point that you can't do it. The point is that without that creative supplement, 
uh, art can lose its own ground in the in, in the human realm of affairs if art cannot find a relationship back with reality as Freud would put it in Freudian thinking you know art is one point where where the pleasure principle and reality principle can meet together where a subject from his own seeking of his own pleasure without any relationship to reality in his own useless uh, activity can find a relationship back with reality because other subject is also find, find, has, has explored that same thing in himself. It's not because there is, there is some objective reality in which art has some value. No, that's not the reason. The reason for Freud is that because both of us as subjects can actually uh, find a, a common thread in each other's uh, you know, engagement of pleasures in, in some senses. And in, in, that, in that regard, when you start thinking in that lens, when you start thinking, can AI produce art in that sense? So either the two options come up very clearly. Either AI would, uh, would, would, would reach a point where it can become creative like a human being. And then you have to start rethinking the role of technology in the human world. You know, that, that's, that's also a breaking point in some sense. The other point that I think much more realistic is that AI can completely reduce the value of creativity in the human realm itself. And that's a very different question. Where the AI would say that, that you can talk about creativity all you want. I can do the same thing with calculation. Human history has evolved to a point we have enough variables that, that human life is so small in comparison to the thousands of year, years of evolution that we can do the same thing with, creative, with calculation that you think can be done with creativity. Where, where the whole subject's experience can be reduced to calculation. And I think that uh, that point, I don't think we have a good understanding of what are the implications of... What, I mean, it's a completely open question. Maybe we don't need creativity. I'm not saying that we... That's why I said it's a very small... Very, uh, I'm, I'm being very humble and very open about it. But at least we should confront that idea... Um, uh, in that in that spirit that that when you're talking about art and AI, we are discussing a very specific point of convergence where human beings are saying that we can do without a very necessary human impulse from which paradigmatic jumps in human history have taken place. And they are saying that we can calculate the existing material from the existing material itself and find new combinations from it. It's almost like, you know, Rubik's Cube. We can keep on playing with the same cube and finding new combinations within that, you know. Framework. I, I I would open it for you. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Wow. So let's let's bring a uh, Rookmacher in this in this equation, right? Um. So you know Michelle's presentation on Rookmacher art and technology. Um. It seems like when she was breaking that down, every kind of like phase in history had its like response. Right. The art had its own response to what was going on in society. And that sort of reflected a metaphysical reality. So I'm curious if AI art starts taking over, what does that represent in terms of metaphysical reality? Right. I'm very curious about what that actually means. Um, but another question that really intrigued me is <laughs> this, this almost sounds like a super obvious question because we're already engaged in it. But it, I feel like. I feel like it, it isn't clear to me in in like a mo in a very sincere way when we're concerned about this what what is what does this concern mean exactly like you know what I, you know what I mean like this is like we're already questioning this and we're we're already assuming it's a concern but for me it isn't clear what this concern actually means in the moment of our questioning it like there must be something, and this is a sort of Heideggerian twist, right? In the moment of our questioning, we're already implying some type of answer, which already raises our concern, right? Our concern is some type of answer. I'm just curious about what that is when we keep raising the concern of AI and art, you know? Other than that, I'll just leave it there. Um, I think that I think that's a really important question. And this is kind of what uh, Alex Eber brought this up last time, that like, like AI art is not necessarily going to be that the AI creates like a Mona Lisa that hangs in a in a museum, right? It's more going to be that the AI is going to create these like crazy holographic temples is essentially what it is, right? Like once Silicon Valley gets understands ontological design, shit is going to get so crazy. You know what I mean? Like once once they begin to understand the way that and they're already doing it. You know what I mean? They're already talking about like they do these weird diets and like fasting and 
um, you know, breathing techniques and sort of like these brain hacks, you know what I mean? This is the beginnings of ontological design, right? And once they, once they really wrap their heads around this idea of designing the subject in relation to the environment and they start employing AI to like track your eyes and project images on the wall and, you know, whisper sounds in your ears so as to design the subject, it's going to get crazy, right? And that's what worries me. It's not, it's not that like musicians will be out of business because there will be robots on a stage doing a concert. Like it'll be, it'll be a fundamentally different relationship to image, to sound, to, to procession and story that will be uh, mediated, if not controlled by AI. And I guess that that's the, that's the worry is that we will sort of implement these AI systems to to uh, enforce ontological design onto us, and then we'll lose control of it, and we'll just become slaves to this robot ontological design system. So that's what worries me personally. It's not that, it's not just that like the robots are going to make paintings and we can't tell who made it. It's that it's going to create this entirely. It's, I mean, it's temples. You know what I mean? It's it's going to they're going to create spaces in which you enter into so as to to have an intentional change in your subjectivity. Um, and like, how is that change regulated? What is it aimed towards? Right? These are all these are all concerns that I have. So that's how that's how I would respond to that question. I think that's a great question. It makes me jump in my seat, literally. Um, <laughs> um, I would propose I would propose that when AI, when S S Silicon Valley understands ontological design. And AI can be developed to the point where it can siphon through that implicit information and understand what explicit information needs to be presented to create those those temples for the phenomena to kind of come to the to the viewer. I think it's not going to be in a. I think it's going to be actually pretty good, and let me let me tell you why. I think it's going to be good in the sense that they're going to be able to explicitate meaning more tangibly in front of us. So, like, the, the, this meaning crisis is because we can't explicitate our meaning properly. We can't appropriate it in a way that is fashionable for the everyday life. It's very, it's very hard. So... AI will be able to present that in my mind. Will they'll, they'll be able, like, just to reiterate, just to siphon through the implicit information to create explicit information in a way that is more meaningful to us. And that does bring in the, like, just to tie that into the meaning, what is the meaning of, con of concern? To me, it's this, it's going to be, it's this feedback loop. So it's like, if AI is able to present a more meaningful presentation to us, then the meaning of concern, we will, I lost my thought, but basically the, 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 the meaning of the concern, like we'll be concerned more about life and more about existence. It would be, it would be a, it would be a feedback loop, like a positive one, strictly in the sense that I'm, I'm trying to like formulate these thoughts like in real time. So forgive me. Um, the, 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 the meaning will make us understand what's meaningful in our life. And a question can arise. How do you know, how do you not know that people will just gravitate and be addicted to that phenomena that's, that's giving you the feeling of meaning. And to me, my response is like, like aletheia, like truth that's presented to you will only make you reflect in your own internal feedback loop, like internally in a more positive light. It will, it will make you be able to siphon out what is that like, hedonistic pleasure that you're falling into or make you be more consciously aware of these things and the, and the outcome of them because the AI will present a more meaningful life to you. Marvelous. And uh, again, one of the things I appreciate about, appreciate about you fine gentlemen, people who come to the net is the willingness to discuss a topic 
that um, needs to be elaborated on as opposed to just coming and presenting something you already know, because I think that's actually what needs to be occurring now when you're dealing with these issues like AI and art and different things like that. So I just wanted to take a moment to say I really appreciate that because this seems to be really, really important and very, very paradoxical and strange uh, what's going on here. So for example, if we're talking about that the meaning of art has something to do with the process that arose to the art, you know, Chitan talked about creativity, um, then that would mean something that is not located in the art changes the meaning of the art, which is very strange because that would mean that the subject has a relation to the context, but context is not located in the subject. You know, like, like practice is defined by theory to use Chitan's language from his paper, and yet the theory is not located in the practice. This is very strange. Uh, so there's always something that is not there in the thing of which is giving definition to the thing that cannot be located in the thing. And if you look too closely at the thing for the context, then you lose sight of the context and then you lose the whole meaning. So there's this very strange double action that has to be going on. And I think if indeed the pro if you have two um, Mona Lisa's and one of them is created by human creativity and the other is a result of AI calculation, we are suggesting that there is something different between those. And if that is the case, then the definition of a thing is not merely its final output, which is very interesting because we tend to kind of just think that things are what result when what is being suggested here is that the sum of the thing is actually part of its very definition. And yet the process is absent from the final subject. Um, Mr. Luber, I think, is alluding to, it seems to me, to Mr. Fishman's point, that there's this notion of being able to resist ontological design and being controlled. Our willingness to even resist that ontological design may be tied to seeing significance in what it means to be a human being. And that might be tied to the question of defining the absence of the human element of apathetic or insignificant might be what motivates us to even care if we are being ontologically designed by something out of our control. So to me, the two questions might go together, which I think uh, hints at what Mr. Luber is getting at as well. Also, what's interesting is we kind of forget this, and this is a seal point. Um, you know, we forget when we say, oh, brains are just computers. Well, we forget we create computers and then retrospectively say that brains are like computers, right? It's more like computers are like brains, but we forget that once we create those, we start saying, oh, the brain is just the computer. So there's a way in which AI can be an expression of unique human creativity. And then you could say, well, hold on, Dan, if we make AI that just creates all these different things, since that resulted from human creativity, even if humans stop being creative at that point, isn't there a sense in which human creativity lives on? You know, doesn't it continue to go even after us? So maybe it's like, you know, there's a weird um, theological tradition, and then I'll pass it to Chichon and Javier, where it's precisely the fact that it seems as if the universe doesn't need God to operate. That is precisely evidence that, you know, God is greater than the universe. And yet precisely because the universe seems to be able to operate without God, that could be evidence that there is no God, right? Or it could be evidence that God is ever exceedingly greater than what the universe. So there's this weird, it's like what Ebert is saying, that infinity and nothing uh, are kind of identical, kind of Schrodinger's cat. Um, and, and likewise with that, if we create an AI that does all our creation for us and humans are no longer needed, could that be evidence that humans are greater? You know, precisely because we are that of which no, we have managed to give rise to a world that is ordered to op able to operate without us, but is a result of us. Could that be a testament to the greatness of the human element? And yet, funny enough, that would precisely be the point when it would be tempting to think that we're insignificant, right? That we don't matter because, look, the world can go on without us. Like a God who says, look, I created a world that can create itself. So what, what good am I, right? Uh, and it's funny to think of that because if that's the kind of situation that might be arising, then having the internal spiritual mental resources by which to interpret that situation as a testament to humanity as opposed to an effacement of humanity would seem utterly paramount. And then the question would be, how do you get those resources? Where do those resources come from? Can you spread the material conditions of which give rise to those resources? And of course, we have to complexify what we mean by that, but that's alluding to earlier net conversations. And if we cannot spread those conditions, you know, what does that mean? And so those are open questions. But I, I, with that, I will pass to Chitan and then Javier. I'll just quickly add to what Daniel was saying, actually, where it, it actually went. Um, you know, we should not be surprised that AI can produce art. It, of course, can. Let's just be honest about it. It can not because AI is a great artist, something of that nature. It can because it is, it is taking from the art that humans have already produced. 
you know they, they that ai can already presuppose a dali being be, behind it thus it can produce a, a painting like dali in that sense and uh, uh, in, in which one should be open to that that possibility that human beings in their lifetime can never exhaust the art that ai is producing for us we may not we may you know we may be surprised at the amount of information that is there which can be reprocessed us in, in, in the challenge is that if if art gets reduced to only that activity of reproducing all information then what happens to 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 to, to, to the society which, which which had art as a had a function as a function in, in in their lives and so on and so forth you know that's that's the real question because it's it's not the, the, the picture is not as simple as if ai does that something will break down nothing will break down it can do that and that will be art for a lot of people you know that that we have that kind of information you know by, by calculation i simply mean that you are dependent upon the past information that you collected that is calculation that you get anything that you can you can create something out of it is dependent upon past information the the bigger challenge actually is that in human beings creativity is also dependent upon calculation it's only when human beings start calculating something that we are able to create create some creative output so to that degree any creativity in human being is only that limited excess that comes from calculation itself so you can't even make that distinction between ai and humans so then how do you see that future and i think that's an open i think you know yeah thank you that's a good It's a good question. <laughs> um, I'm not even sure if I can approach it like that. Um, but I, but like theologically speaking, it, it, AI, like the, the that breakdown that you talk about, Jitan, that sort of disappearance between AI and humans, it, it does make me think about going back to Brooks Song again, where he talks about this sort of like creative unfolding, right? Everything is sort of like in constant creation, right? Um, I think. when ai becomes a part of the picture this becomes clearly more manifest that everything is more in this unfolding creation right but of course now the crisis becomes more apparent um where man himself goes again where is my position in all of this right and i and i think daniel's right right the question becomes more pressing about what is man and and this whole idea you know because this is this is why we're raising the concern right <laughs> because once ai takes over a function that we thought was ours right that was solely ours it does raise the question again what is man in in this like entirety again um and it almost seems like you know we we've spent so much time like asking like what is god and everything but it's funny because really those two are so parallel when you think about it what is god what is man they're like they're just so ambiguous and mysterious that it it's it's almost like if we just focus on asking what is man we could probably get something close to what we think is god <laughs> you know it's ironic right um <clears throat> but yeah cuz again we have to think about the reflective nature and there's so much in theology talks about this right like um in islam they talk about in the hadith um it's where like uh it's quoted from the prophet saying whatever my servant thinks of me i am right so there is this constant reflection going on about whatever you think of god is that's how god thinks of you in return right if you if you're angry against god angry god is angry <laughs> with you it's like this mutual reflection constantly going on so i think ai i mean it's funny cuz like we'll have a problem with ai doing that exact reflection against us where it's like they're creating art <clears throat> and we don't know how to respond um to that whole issue uh but yeah i think i i think you know it, it's obviously going to raise it's going to make us go back to the basics again about what is man what is art <laughs> you know this is going to totally change like what we think about our previous definitions um and so we have to talk about that I guess you know, and I don't have an answer. I can't answer to Todd's question. <laughs> you know, like, uh, it's so hard. But yeah, I mean, I think it's it's obviously gonna shake up those. We're gonna be in groundless ground again, right? So it's exciting and scary at the same time. But yeah, I they they are scary questions, but I I do question like um, 
AI's relationship to sensation in the sense that the reason why it's so hard for us to like be so aware of how exactly we're siphoning the implicit information into the explicit information is because we're in the sensational realm. And like, to me, like in a high degree sense, it's that we're always in a mood and we're th always thrown. And in that sense, it's, it's, we're, we're standing in the midst of all this, uh, chaos a little bit, all this conflict is how I, I, I like to think of it. And in that sense, I feel like AI will be able to, AI is not thrown in the sense that we are. It's thrown in a different sense. Like they're thrown in a more explicit sense. Like they explicitly are there in order to compute implicit information into explicit information more rapidly, more readily available. Like we could not give such a definition like that to the human being. Like, it just wouldn't make sense. Like, there's something, like, cold about the process of, of AI that seems necessary for humans to be a part of because there's a lack of coldness in the human condition because we're in that sensational realm. Like, that's why I think when we go back to, like, this like when you're talking about this, like this groundless territory that we're approaching, if not already in, um, that's why I think like stories are so important. And I think storytelling is that ground for us to, you know, give knowledge and whatnot. So, My, my 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 point is is that uh, AI, I feel like will be always treated as a means, and humans aren't means, and that's that that that's all I really want to say. Outstanding. Uh, a few things. So there's this interesting notion, like you have that uh, uh, Clamor, David Clamor, where he talks about consciousness and the zombie experiment, where he says, if you have a human being, that's a zombie, but it's missing qualia, you know, the sensation, the kind of unique conscious phenomenon, but you couldn't tell the difference at all between the uh, Daniel of which has consciousness and the Daniel of which is just a zombie. You know, his argument is that something is still missing. You know, there's still something different between those things, even if you cannot necessarily put a finger exactly on what it is. It's very difficult to put a finger on what it is. What's interesting about that is qualia as so described. It, this is what's interesting. You know, the, the negativity that Zizek talks about as being like uh, essentially human. And when he talks about the problem with the singularity in the wired, his book on Hegel and the wired brain is that it cannot have that negativity. You know, that notion, there, there's a difference between saying, you know, his famous story, there's a difference between the coffee not having milk and not having sugar. Same negativity, but there's actually a difference between those two things. And so for Zizek and the singularity, what will happen is will be unveiled that you cannot have in that the same negativity of which defines the human condition. And yet what will be weird is you won't also see that negativity. And so you can't see that it's not there and yet it won't be there. And that's what gets really weird is because this qualia that like in a claimer sense, this unique sensational phenomenological experience that defines consciousness that is absent in AI is simultaneously a kind of negativity because you can't put your finger on what exactly it is or where is it. And this is a funny thing. When AI appears and basically you have this temptation, because here's the thing, let's say an AI, we, yeah, sure. We know AI does not have the same thrownness as the human being, but it's so good at what it does. Maybe thrownness is overrated. Like that will be a temptation, right? You'll start going, man, yeah, we have a unique thrownness. That really sucks. I wish I had the thrownness of the AI, right? So how can we as a human being, here's the thing, we as a human being will have to somehow have the internal resources to choose to think that our thrownness for some reason matters. And that's where if we see it as apathetic as opposed to insignificant, that's gonna be really hard, but it's gonna be really, really difficult to not think that actually our thrownness sucks as opposed to being some sort of benefit. And I have this image now of kind of like God creating a universe that can create on his own kind of going, uh, I guess I don't have much of a role and kind of being depressed about it um, as opposed to going, man, look at me. I created this thing that can make itself. That's awesome. Wow, it doesn't even need me. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm able to make something that doesn't need me. 
in a sense, right? You know, can human beings create AI and go, wow, that's amazing that we're able to make something that can work without us. That seems really difficult to do because it seems more natural to say, wow, it can do stuff without me. I made something that doesn't need me. Well, I guess I'm not needed. It's very difficult to interpret the situation as an affirmation of negativity as opposed to an experience of negativity in the negative, in a bad sense, right? In a deconstructive sense. It seems really difficult to do that. Um, and, and where does one get the resources by which to see it positively as opposed to negatively? Um, also, what's interesting, a few things. One, I'm now thinking about AI as kind of, you know, in Christianity, they talk about the hypostatic union or whatever, where Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. It's almost like AI is 100% tech and 100% mind. Like it's like man and tech at the same time. It's this weird like hypostatic union that we've made in AI. I'll have to think about that, but it came to mind. The other thing is what's interesting in Christianity is so God makes this universe that can create itself is basically kind of the notion. Um, and so what does God delight in? He delights in the community of the Trinity like other people, right? So he's like, he finds his delight in himself somehow, but himself is defined essentially by a community, you know? And that's where it's like three persons, one essence. It's interesting to think, and then I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak. Um, if indeed human beings generate technologies that are able to create the world on, you know, to be basically humans without human, it would seem at that point, the essentialness of community and relation becomes really, really paramount to where we can delight in other human beings. Uh, and, and that seems like it's going to be a really big deal. And yet the funny thing is that it's quite clear that these technologies that we invent makes it easier and easier to be isolated. So these technologies we create that are going to perhaps bring to the forefront this negativity that defines the essential human element, if we're going to live with that realization and then not lead to like a mass deconstruction, we will possibly need community with other human beings to delight in if we just use that kind of Christian language. And yet the very arising of those technologies also tend to create the conditions where it becomes remarkably easy to be isolated to be cut off, to go into bubbles, to only interact with people you want to interact with. So how does one resist that natural trajectory, right? Well, this brings us to the question and I'll pass to whoever wants to speak. We've been asking, whatever the inner resources are of which resist that trajectory, do we think it's only a minority of people that can have that? Do we think that it can be spread to lots of people? You know, it's that question that keeps coming up, right? It's the, um, we change it from the problem of scale to the problem of spread. We've talked about how religions have been, they'd have different structures of which dealing with that in the kind of the theological structure, which we may philosophically and socially need to think about. Um, and, it, and it's curious to, to resume that, but with that, I'll pass it on to Mr. Luber. Um, to me, it's like balancing, the, it's like balancing between emanation and eminence. I mean, not emanation, eminence, emanation, and uh, I forget the, the other counter, but, but basically just having that, that meta drive with the actual physical uh, experience. And I just think if we like kind of take ontological design and like I agree with the book a lot, and we just think about it in terms of how we design this artificial intelligence will literally just give us a way to us to keep designing the artificial intelligence in a way that will keep giving us ideas to design the artificial intelligence. I think it's going to be like this, this feedback loop that will kind of give weights off our shoulders in the sense that, uh, we're going to be thankful that we are we have this thrownness because we can keep giving back to this thing that doesn't have this thrownness this uh better quote unquote better thrownness like i don't think looking at it in terms of that would be beneficial because it's just missing what what the potential could be it's like the potential of of our experience could be like our grandkids could be laughing at us for like talking in this fashion. Like, look how old grandpa, look how old you are for doing this. Like you're so like corny or whatever. Like who knows? Like t t to me, I think it's limiting when we try to make it like good or bad and we make it decisive like that. When the question like, 
it's all about the question. And, and, and if the question comes from like a wrong place, to me, it like restricts the, the, the dialogos basically. So, yeah. No, and I, and I will add to that. Um, well, when I am actually very old. I was born about 50. So, you know, uh, the kids will just unveil it. I was going to say to Teton's point, it's almost like when we develop these AIs that can then paint really well, it forces the human in order to make their thrownness valuable to them. They have to do, it's almost like we're going to be forced by our AI to create new categories of art. So, for example, the difference between painting and glass blowing, right? It's hard to imagine AI creating an entirely new category of art. Um, now, I'm not saying that's impossible because, you know, if humans can do it, we can arguably program something to do that as well. But it's interesting to think if the pressures of AI will make us go, oh, man, AI can paint, you know, better than human beings can. Well, I guess I'm going to have to create an entirely new category of art. And one wonders what that thinks. You see, this is what, one of the reasons I think that might be the case is precisely because, because that is so unthinkable right now. Like you think, and you're like, well, what in the world would a new category of art be? Would it be like building houses or agriculture or like that? The very fact that that is so hard to think is evidence that that's precisely where the human element will have to go. Because if it's hard to think, then AI, we can't program AI to think it. Um, and so, you know, the very fact that's so difficult to imagine, and it is so rag radically speculative, may be why AI pressures us in that direction. And then... If indeed the pressures of AI result in us creating hundreds and hundreds of new kinds of art, AI is a blessing. AI is a great thing because otherwise we would have never had that pressure to create those entirely new categories of art and creativity. It doesn't just have to be art. It could be design. It could be all sorts of things. Um, so that so I think it is important, Mr. Luber, on what you're saying. Um, it's not either good or bad. This is where, to me, when Hegel's talking about interpretation, it's a big deal because we're not... It's funny because we're not saying we're going to destroy Dali. We're asking of what is the manner of interpreting Dali that actually, for me, it's like choose. I think Dali is going to unveil a kind of a kind of negativity to the human being that then we will have to either interpret as apophatic or interpret as evidence that humans are insignificant. And that's almost like why, and it's another topic, but it's always interesting how in Hegel's absolute knowing, you have some interpretations that are like very theistic on absolute knowing where it points to a God and others that say, no, it unveils an essential human negativity. I think a lot of that has to do is that the absolute limit of the human condition is precisely the point of a choice where then one can choose that it points to something theological or it chooses that it points to something that's transcendent of um, regular immediacy, but is still a negativity that is part of finitude itself, which is I would think I, what I think Zizek says. But it's funny to think that precisely at that absolute limit, there's a choice, a radical choice, that is based on an interpretation that can go either way. And I think that starts to kind of hint, I have to write that, well, I wrote that paper, but it's, it's a mess, uh, on why there seems to be this um, both interpretation of Hegel in a very theological way and then in a more Zizekian way that can put essential negativity in the human, human case. But the, the point is that it's, I think it is very important to realize that it's not really good or bad. It's a matter of interpretation of what is presented to you. Like, how do we interpret it? Do we, inter do we interpret it as evidence that the essential human element is something that cannot be captured in, in, in infinitude, in immediacy? Or do we interpret it as evidence that humans are replaceable? And that's what AI is going to kind of force us to choose. And will we have the internal resources to make a choice that makes humans apathetic um, and live according to that in a manner that intrinsically motivates us to keep going or to keep creating or searching for these new categories of creativity? That will be very difficult. And I think, and then I'll pass it on to Javier, it seems to be like if we, if we take all of that possible spin, there seems to be a difference between defending AI that will unveil to us our essential negativity and defending ourselves from AI that wants to ontologically design us. So it seems like, or control us, you could even say, because obviously corporation power control. So it seems like this is kind of a multi, there's kind of different tiers. So one, I think we all agree that we need to develop the resources somehow to avoid ourselves from being overly controlled by the algorithms. Now, of course, even that has to be complexified because it's sometimes very nice when Google tells you something that you may like, and it is what you like, right? Sometimes it's nice when the algorithms actually guide you. So even that has to be um, um, complexified. But I think we can all agree 
that we don't want to say be controlled into fascism or something like that, right? Okay, well, let's say, let's assume we do that. Let's assume we avoid that kind of technological capture. Then we have the next tier of technology that unveils to us our negativity, okay? This kind of apathetic or insignificant thing. That is then when it will be our temptation, we will be tempted at that point to destroy technology precisely because it makes us feel insignificant. Or we can face the challenge and choose to say, no, AI is unveiling our essential negativity, which is actually evidence of our greatness, of our essential human element, um, and then use that in a, in, in, a, in a more positive way. So it seems like there are steps to this, but with that, I'll give it to Mr. Javier Rivera. So <laughs> I, I think um, I'm going to bring Nietzsche in here because I think this is going to get really funny, right? Like, can you imagine like an overman AI? <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, so this is what he meant by uh, being more than human. <laughs> you know? um, but, you know, what's interesting is that we talk about Nietzsche and AI. What makes the overman so specifically overman for Nietzsche is the fact that he can fail. The fact that he has to fail. Right. So I think this kind of goes back to the apophatic subject. And this is what's going to be very different from AI. Right. We design AI to not fail. <laughs> we specifically designed a to be basically a hundred percent success, right? It's not supposed to fail. That's the point. Um, we as subjects, however, we fail. And that is a very crucial element in that whole process, right? It does seem like when AI comes into the picture, um, failing is going to be a very crucial concept, right? What does failing allow us to be and become when everything around us is sort of succeeding, right? It's never fails, so to speak, um, right? Because I, I think, you know, again, I have a lot of friends that are obsessed with the AI thing. Eventually, they would like AI to have consciousness and like so on and like their own response, right? But I, I am not sure that we necessarily would want AIs to fail, right? Because there's always that uh, fear, right? Uh, but yeah, I think failure is going to become more important. But in terms of like uh, Luber's response uh, in like this feedback loop, right? Um, I think it becomes more pressing that in order to not be designed, like um, Zach keeps, you know, stressing on, is that it becomes more important like philosophers like Buber and Nietzsche, that we understand that all, like all of us as human beings, we have to have a response and not, we don't accept like a universal response, right? That's the whole point is that we all respond in our own fashion of responding, right? And I think that's the importance of like Nietzsche and Buber is that they very much call to us not to respond to something universally, but to respond individually in our in the best way that we can. And that's how you would sort of like mutually respond back to the feedback loop that wants to design you in response, right? Um, so there needs to be a mutual designing and designed feedback loop, right? The danger is, the danger is that we don't respond and we just become like this feedback loop where we just keep becoming designed. That would be the problem. Right, so we need to have this response where we are doing the same thing, right? There needs to be a mutual response. And this is Boober, me shoving Boober into the, like the AI dialect right here, where it's like, the there needs to be, we, we wanna be blurring the lines between designing and designed, right? But we need to respond, that's the point. If we don't respond, then, then um, yeah, I don't know what we're gonna be, right? Because we're so apophatic in nature, I don't know what, what this is gonna do to us. <laughs> You know, so yeah, that's that's my thoughts on that. I quickly say this, Javier. Uh, you can actually def design systems which can learn from their own failures. Fuzzy logic, for instance. I did my engineering uh, thesis on that. <laughs> so <laughs> even even if you have to rethink the very idea of failure in the human context, <laughs> you can have systems, you know, engineering systems which can learn from their own failure in that sense. But luckily, so, that means we're going to fail at failing, so it's all good. But, okay, so I'm going to give it back to Mr. Fish. All right, well, this is great. Everyone's asking tremendous questions. I'm trying to, trying to keep it all in mind here. Um, let's see. As far as failing, like I, um, maybe, maybe you could expand on this a little, Javier, because I think that humans, like we definitely do fail, but we, we aspire towards success, right? Like you don't, want, you don't want your 
pilot to fail, right? You want your pilot to succeed. So they go through all the training and they practice failing in the, in the simulator so that they can succeed when it comes to it, right? I feel like AIs do the same thing, right? They try, like those AI developers went through all sorts of failures, right? They type in pig riding a bat and it gives you some random image and they have to say, no, that's a failure. Um, and I guess really like it's, it's the human element that can differentiate that, uh, that success from failure, right? Because the AI doesn't know that it failed, right? So we have to make that distinction, um, which all comes down to worship, right? It all comes down to relevance realization, if you want to put it in, in a more secular language, um, that like, what, what is relevant to us as humans? That is to me, the essential human element is that, that what is relevant to the AI is not necessarily relevant to us. And it brings back, um, it brings back what Andrew Luber was saying about how like the AI can help us to make explicit what is implicitly meaningful, right? But that assumes that the AI understands what is implicitly meaningful to us and shares our interests, right? Which I'm not convinced that it does because to me, like it comes down to the fleshy body. You know what I mean? It's like the AI doesn't understand, the AI will never understand the meaning of a hug. You know what I mean? And so like, how the AI determines what is relevant to us in order to project that particular image, as opposed to all the other ones that it could project in that moment, um, is dependent on the AI having the capacity for relevance realization in relation to the human, not relation into what is relevant to the AI, right? And the problem is that eventually the AI will, will begin to, to uh, process what is relevant to the AI, right? It'll, it'll show you the image not that is meaningful to you, but which is which is likely to make you uh, reproduce the AI, right? Um, and so, like, what what is meaningful? There's there's also a sense in which what is meaningful to us is given to us, right? Like Andrew was talking about this meeting of emergence and emanation, where it's like we have our desires that emerge kind of bottom up, but then we have the emanating structure of our religion, of our culture, of our society telling us, no, you shouldn't want that. That is actually not relevant to you. This is more relevant, and we have to sacrifice our, our uh, emerging desires in, in favor of the emanating desire, right? And so the emanating desire is not human in origin or is not like i think what the what daniel's getting at with the apophatic thing is that what monotheism has done brilliantly is that they've recognized the desire is in relation to the other right so we look to the other we look to the group to tell us what we should desire and they they put the ultimate other beyond this world so that we must look beyond this world not to an idol but to to the beyond itself in order to gain insight and to tell us what should be relevant to us, right? And so to me, the concern is that AI is, it's just an idol, you know what I mean? It's like, we're gonna, we're gonna look for our desire in the AI and the AI has its own will, its own desire, its own uh, emanating structure, which like you're saying, uh, Javier, we can, we need to respond to that, but how do we respond to that if we're looking for our AI to, to mediate our response, right? So it, it necessitates a, a human religious structure by which we respond to the AI. But then if we're using the AI to replace our human religious structures, then we're kind of screwed, right? And if, if we're not gonna use AI to replace our human religious structures, then, then what's, what's the AI gonna do, right? And so, so that's where I'd go with all that. Well, I'm gonna give it to Titan and then Mr. Luber. And it almost makes me think there of the difference between an icon and an idol. You know, are we gonna have to choose if AI is an idol or will we choose if it's an icon in kind of the Orthodox sense? And of course, between the Catholics and the, and the, and the Greek Orthodox, that was a big friggin' deal, right? Like you can't, you know, they were like, you can't do, there's no difference. Icons are idols. And there's like, no, there is a difference. And it's interesting that we are going to be presented. AI might present us with a choice of is it an idol or is it an icon? If we say, well, we actually want it to be an icon. Okay, well, what is the thing? What do we worship through, to use your language? What do we worship through the AI so that it is an icon as opposed to an idol? That seems to be, that could be quite tricky, but I'll, I'll pass it on to Chichan and then Andrew and then Javier. Yeah, it's such a wonderful discussion. I just sort of, uh, I, I have to leave, but I'll sort of make this point that, you know, one of the, one of the questions that we need to think about um, technology in general and AI as a specific manifestation of that is that that we, we talk about meaning crisis as a very generic term. What, what is it at the heart of that problem? Heart of that problem is that human beings desire 
is always linked to technical implements. You can't do desiring. That is why desires can be reduced to drives very fast. You know, drive always circulates the object. It's only in desire that you can get an external object in that sense. You know, and and in that transition from drive to desire, there is always something technical involved over there. There is something, tech, some kind of technicity which is involved in that transition. So, for instance, this is already there in Freud. And recently, say, for example, like Bernard Stiegler develops it from, you know, say Freud, uh, uh, you know, Lacan in that sense. That that technicity is, is at the heart of both these movements. The problem actually exists that the same technicity can be used to reduce its drive, desires to your drive back. You know, so the, the challenge of technology is not simply that technology will become a human being and then what we do. The, te the challenge of technology is that that it can sufficiently replace the role of desire in the human human social sphere, such that we can be reduced to only our drives. If we have another human being as technology, we'll be okay with it. You know, and then as Daniel is saying, we can have a quality affirmation of that also. The challenge becomes at the point where technology takes the, the role that tech, technicity has in the lives of, of transitioning from drive to desire, of doing the calculation ourselves. I can give an example of that. For example, when we go for GPS, uh, we use a GPS in that sense. So when I have to go back, go to my school or a college, I remember that route every day. When I remember that route, I'm able to find new ways of engaging with that path that takes me to my college, my work, whatever. But if I have a GPS and I only follow my GPS every day, I have outsourced the calculation that I needed to do myself to create desires and sufficient uh, attachment, a sufficient uh, form of uh, recognition to that route, which I would have a nostalgia about 10 years later in my life. When I travel. So, for example, the nostalgia that I have about traveling to my school may not exist when I to the places I travel to today. Because that school I used to walk on my own every day. You know, you can find these these kind of structures everywhere. That there's something about technical about this transition from drive to desire, and unless you're able to think through that, and without desire, you can't engage with reality. You can only engage with your own pleasures. I think that challenge. I think we need to start thinking about in a very you know, yeah, just thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, you you just gave me a lot to think about. Uh. It's it's tough in these discussions when you have a thought and a response, and then someone says such interesting things, and it just I just drift away from that thought slowly. It's it's crazy. Um, but baby steps. For the first thing, I want to just respond to the whole notion of like failure. Um, again, I'd like it's like that initial starting point, like. Failure. I don't think failure is that initial starting point. Like, just because, just to compare it to a story, like, like the classic. If you, let's say, you wanted to go in the military and then you fail in in doing so, but like, if you would have gone, your life would have been taken immediately. Let's say, like, who who knows what failure is? Maybe that's actually a success in certain respects. So I think because I can play with failure in such a way with story and framing that it can't be the starting point to, to, uh, to that. So to me, uh, like a good starting point, like what you were saying, what's the meaning of concern? And I think when you figure out what you're concerned about and why you're concerned about it. So to me, I would call that the theme is why you're concerned about it, how you, how you sway in relation to what the theme of what you're concerned about is telling you. And like what that, what that means to me is simply that in relation to the AI conversation, when AI gives you something it, there's it, you're immersed in something but what we're in control of is the emanation aspect like internally like i as a storyteller can tell myself that let's say i'm doing like like i don't know like i'm playing video games and it's like real life call of duty and i'm like killing people and it feels like i'm actually killing people 
I can tell myself because I'm in the video game that this is a like the, the framing. Like this is a crude example, but like the, I can frame myself and appropriately put that in the right drawer, so to speak, and exit that video game and not kill people. So I think that that's just a sign that the emanation aspect of that like of that juxtaposition between emanation and I, I, I keep mixing the words up, but um, basically that A and B, uh, that aspect, the B is totally in, in, our, in, our, in our hand. And I think AI is nothing without us. And in that sense, what would AI do if we weren't like putting in information into it? It would do nothing. It would just keep exhausting the information that we've already put into it. So that's where we come in handy, where we will constantly put in new information. Like, even if it's redundant, like in sentiment, redundant information, just our approach to that information is new in itself. And thus the AI that whatever it generates will still change. Like, if we're... If, since we're so not concrete, but AI is so concrete because it captures a very concrete aspect of our life, which is the world, like the world aspect, it can capture that. We can't capture that because we're in it. But since we're aware that we're in it, since we're aware that we're the beings in question, we can frame how we ask ourselves these questions in any way we like, because we can always ask the question and that's and that's the and that's uh i, I kind of went on on a, on a tangent but that question the ability to ask the question the why of the why that we're asking the question is always the starting point so i'm not going to be able to manipulate that question because for me to manipulate the why of the why for me essentially for me to manipulate the theme is just essentially changing my perspective around. It's, it's, it's still like you're writing a story to a certain theme and then you realize like you get a new insight and it's like, I'd rather say this. So what happens is you change fundamental choices and the context around those choices, you change those things based off of the insight that you have. So in that sense, it's this like feedback loop where regardless of what content, so to speak, the AI, the AI gives us for us to present these choices, we will then be able to say to ourselves, ask ourselves the question, the why of the why in the situation. And based off that starting point, like not do certain things, like, if I wanted to, I could not order things on Amazon. Like, if I actually wanted to. Like, but my, it, it's, it's, it's working in accordance to my theme. So why would I change that? I don't, see an, I don't see a real issue, a conflict in that. But the day will come where something that AI gives me will give me conflict, true conflict, where it won't even be a choice in a way it'll just seem obvious for me to go against it and i think we have yet to like come to that point like we've started to in the sense that like with instagram you can like put on a notification and, and it can tell you how long you've been on so you can be aware of how long you're being encapsulated encapsulated by these <clears throat> these uh these programmed algorithmic things so I think as AI continues, our awareness of our relationship of AI will continue. And in that sense, we'll always be able to um, rearrange the situation because that emanation aspect in the emerging, in the emergence is on, is, that's the humans. That's on the human being. Like AI can never tell me what actually is eminent. Only I can tell me. 
few things. First, what we're trying to do at the net is achieve our own line of flight and incomprehensibility by overloading the system with uh, ideas as opposed to just dressing like a clown on the back of a pig. So there's two options of Delusian lines of flight. And we're trying, you know, that's where we have all these different threads. So I salute everyone for diving into that context to achieve a line of flight. Two things quickly and I'll pass it to Javier. It would seem as if an idol is when drive and desire are indistinguishable, where an icon is where drive and desire are distinct. And it would seem like that's going to be really critical. Second, you can't fail unless you're trying. Uh, so trying has to come first or the commitment, the real choice, and then the failure. You know, if you fail because you never did anything, the failure is concealed, actually. And this is like kind of the horror. And this kind of points also to where process and end are together. The failure that results in the middle of a trying is different from the failure of never doing. The never doing failure is invisible. And that's almost like worse, right? Because you actually don't experience yourself as failure. So like I didn't fail, but actually you're failing in the sense of you missed out on the story. Uh, you missed out on what you could have lived had you followed the theme in which you could have failed. So I think that's quite important. Um, and it's interesting to think though that AI is designed to try things that it will not fail at, which means that it can't have this kind. AI could have the kind of failure of never trying because we never program it to do something, but it would seem this kind of failure of which emerges in the real choice, in the commitment, is something that AI is precisely designed to avoid. Whereas humans, because of the creative faculty to abstract reason and try things that don't exist, we don't even know always what it means to fail or to succeed until we do it. And that seems to point, the possibility of that failure in creation seems to be kind of a unique human ability of which I think feeds the theme and story. Because often the protagonist in the story will fail in a way that is unexpected. You know, there's something will occur that arises that they don't see happening but they couldn't have failed in that unexpected way unless they engaged in the theme of which then created the story that has this unexpected failure occurs. Frodo can't get bit by the spider that he doesn't know is there unless he tries to go to Mount Doom, right? So there's a, but then that failure becomes an opportunity for Sam to prove that he's pretty awesome too. Uh, the other thing I want to say that um, it is curious to wonder if AI is going to be capable of interpreting or is it an interpretation is a unique human ability. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say, and you know, I'm doing what happened to you to Javier now. I'm adding a lot of things. So then when it's his time to speak, he'll just pet his cat. Um, there is some, you said this really important phrase where you said AI is nothing without us. I really like that phrase because here's, here's the idea. It's almost like if AI becomes really powerful, humans will walk around the world and they'll need to do the following. Look around and go, man, this stuff would be nothing without us. Wow. As opposed to looking around and going, wow, look at this stuff that made us nothing. The ability to interpret the situation as evidence that we created something that would be nothing without us, that makes it seem like we're nothing, is going to be paramount because that would be apophatic versus interpreting the situation as evidence that humans are insignificant. Here's the thing. I, again, will go to a Christian kind of theology. It's almost like humans need to be able to walk around and say, man, look at all this AI that would be nothing without us that as a result makes us feel like nothing and we take on the sin of the world. We take on that feeling and bear it like Jesus bearing a cross. So there's a way in which it will give us an occasion to kind of have to bear the weight of the possible interpretation of ourselves as insignificant and the very willingness to bear that would then be evidence of the goodness of the human element. In the same way that in Christianity, God's willingness to die for man, the very death of God is the glory of God, right? So that is what's interesting to kind of apathetically um, interpret the situation that way. And then I'll pass it on to Javier. I think it's interesting also the fact that so many theological schemas are useful in this topic, because it makes me think, you know, Feuerbach kind of said that God is just a projection of man right? It's almost like now it's kind of like um, AI is a projection of human. And so a lot of the theological narratives that were useful for understanding man's relation to God or all those possibilities almost are going to work in regard to AI because there's a similar sort of projection. But here's the thing. It's not because the, I, I go back to what I said, it's not because the brain is merely computation, but because the computation is an expression of the mind. Right. It's very important to get that order, uh, not a reductionist, but an emergence order. And then you say, oh, we projected, you know, the human consciousness into AI. And now it's kind of participating in our being as opposed to our being being replaced by the AI. And man, isn't it amazing that we're capable of doing that? And as we then see glory of us in that, 
we focus on community like God focusing on the Trinity. We focus on relation and recognition and all the things that Buber talks about, which precisely becomes the source of our joy in being human in the same way that God in Christianity finds joy in the different persons of the Trinity that become one essence. It would seem that AI, and I'll give it to Javier, and I think it does tie with Buber, AI might put humanity in a situation where we will need to figure out how to live in a manner where we see one another as persons of the same essence in the same way that the Trinity becomes persons of the same essence. We will be called to a higher level of recognition of the other that will be an intensification of human relationships that we will then have to rise to the occasion of being capable of and is the conditions that make us capable of that something that can be spread is the conditions that make us capable of that something that can be taught or not and then that comes back to that question is it something that we're going to have with that i'll hand it to javier we're coming on the last 15 minutes so if anyone has any closing things to say please go right ahead and mr javier rivera um, okay, a lot was said. <laughs> okay, so to address some of my things on failure, um, I'm always a big, I'm always a big advocate for helplessness, right? I think the notion of helplessness is something that we all anxiety, like we have this anxiety about. We don't like being this mode of helplessness, right? Which is something that Adam Phillips always argues about being almost like fundamental um, to the human condition, almost. Um, this like, very idea of like helplessness. Um, so it almost seems like as a side question to AI, it does seem like we also need to nurture the relationship with our own helplessness, um, which obviously goes into the theological situation that Zach sort of raises, um, the religious situation. Uh, a, a variety of religions have, when it comes to like lay people, it seems like the popular mode is this notion of grace, right? Where you can't do anything because salvation is already there. You just have to simply receive it, right? You get this in Lutheranism. You get this in the Pure Land Buddhism. Uh, you get this in so many facets, right, where there's this debate. It almost seems like AI technology is making this debate happen again, where it's like, oh, are we saved through works? Or are we saved by grace? <laughs> you know, like this, this is the same debate again, because the AI really presses this question, like, are we going to be saved by works? or are we going to be saved by grace? Um, <clears throat> but just to like bring us back again, when we talk about AI and technology, it's interesting that it scares us. And I was thinking about this more, like, it's interesting that it even scares me, right? That it's something that will be able to just sort of be on its own. Um, and yet everything else in the world isn't, is something that I didn't create, right? This thrownness that I'm in, everything else, I interact with everything else that I didn't create, I didn't touch, and yet it doesn't even phase me. But all of a sudden, what phases me is that there's this thing out there that I created that can now create on its own. <laughs> you know, um, I, I think that's that, that's like a fascinating um, kind of observation that it almost seems like, and this I think this the religious question pushes back again into itself, um, where I think our lack of concern for things that are here that obviously didn't have my own making in it, I think some of this relationship needs to be reestablished again because. If we don't establish that relationship with something I didn't create, um, then how are we going to have a relationship with something I did create, right? Because um, it seems like we never nurtured this relationship. And I think Buber actually kind of gets at this a little bit too, right? So my concern about like the idea of like transcendence all the time, right, is that we can never limit God to transcendence. We also have to put in imminence. Imminence is very important in this as well, like the balance between transcendence and imminence, right? So the challenge would be in the religious context, how do we see or find God within the, techno the technological situation, right? How do we nurture that relationship to see the thou, as Buber says, in the technology, right? Um, <clears throat> which is going to be a challenge, but also because we fail to already see that in nature, is kind of important. <laughs> we need to do that first. Um, and then also uh, these sort of like provisional boundaries that we have with our own self. I think it really, 
I think Jesus is a really good example of like being a canonic subject, right? This might be the real challenge, right? AI is going to prove to us that really we are canonic subjects, meaning like we require this self-emptying all the time, right? The problem is we've never established our relationship with self-emptying because we draw these, what I call like, you know, we have this ideal self of what I think I am, this provisional self. But if you really like pay attention to yourself, like when you're breathing and everything, like the, <laughs> it's interesting that we draw the barrier at our skin, right? And yet I inhale air and I need all these things to live. And it's like permeating in and out all the time, right? And yet I draw the barrier at my skin and I say, this is me. Um, so this, it's going to bring back again, the problem of this apophatic subject, because unless I can see myself in the other, um, I'm always going to perceive that other as a threat. Um, so I think, you know, Buber's question of like, how do we, you know, we, we need this responsibility to constantly turn and see the thou within the things that are called I it, right? The things that I, I think that's the problem is that we keep dividing this into subject object, right? Um, we, we definitely, if we are to have any meaning, we need to see what is, you know, just to use Buber's language, the thou in that it, right? Only then, in my opinion, do we experience that meaning. Um, so, of course, the question of spread um, is always a problem, right? Um, but it does seem like religion has had some answers to this in terms of, like, spreading it. It typically involves something so simple that lay, lay people can do. Um, you know, like in Bo Pure Land Buddhism, it's like reduced to just chanting Buddha's like name, Amida Buddha's name. Like it's very simple. And the same thing with like Sufism, just say a law a million times. Like it's like very simple for lay people, right? But what I've noticed as a trend in religions is that typically what happens is the elite, the elite start establishing these types of practices. And then those complicated practices that eventually get reduced to like one thing so that the lay people can become involved in it. And that seems to be like the trend um, so the question would be, what type of practice do we establish? What kind of practice can we look to religion to establish to start to build this relationship uh, where we have like this mutual turning together with technology and ourselves? Um, I think Daniel actually raises a crucial like, you know, you can see a problem and then also saving grace at the same time, right? Like technology could be such a threat that actually forces us to finally see each other as each other, right? And then, then we could turn around the technology situation. So um, there's obviously the threat and the saving grace at the same time in this whole problem. Um, but yeah, that's, I think that's it for me. So a few things, if anyone has last words on the last uh, little bit, please go right ahead. So a few things. One, it's interesting to think that when you look at the cross in Christianity, you don't see an object, you see Jesus, right? So because of something that an individual did with an object, the object no longer becomes a mere object. And I think that's an example, say the cross or the, the lotus tree, et cetera, so forth. And there are these objects and religions that the thou is merged with the it. And that's very interesting because it seems to be a way that someone related to the object that changes the object into something pointing beyond itself. Um, it is also very interesting. So I, I meant to note this earlier, you were talking about the importance of relationship and response. For me, interpretation, relation, and response go together. Those all kind of go together. So the question of interpretation affects relation because that affects how you relate to it and then how you respond to it. So all of those kind of go together for me. So I think when I've been talking about interpretation, I think that ties in with relation and response. The other thing, there is a funny way. We always have to remember that before Jesus goes to the cross, um, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, you know, God, take this cup from me. I don't want to do it. Like he doesn't want the cross, right? Um, and yet because he goes to the cross, there's a kind of resurrection according to Christian theology. In the same way that we as human beings are like, we don't want this AI, you know, take this you know, burden from us. We don't want to be called to it. And there's a way in which almost AI might have the function of kind of humanity's cross, kind of crucifixion. It's something on which the notion of our essential human element as being something that cannot be found in something else is killed. It's forever killed because we find out AI are actually able to do everything that human beings can do. And so it's almost like the computer will replace the cross in a funny way. I'm being kind of tongue in cheek now, but there's a way in which the computer could have like a cross-like function in which we die. And here's the funny thing. At that point, humanity will have a choice. And this you could almost associate with the resurrection. We could say, okay, we died on the cross because we should die because AI doesn't need us and we should die on its cross. Or we can say, no, actually this very fact 
that humanity can be so easily replaced by AI is evidence that one, humans are able to create something that can replace it, which is to its glory because it's kind of sacrificial and it's also a challenge and it's difficult to do that. So that's actually glorifying. And as also this quote unquote crucifixion on the AI uh, brings to light that the essential human element is a negativity of which is apophatic and can also not be fully captured by a single individual and actually is only found in community with the other that the apathetic comes out because really God is not apathetic to himself, right? You know, God is apathetic to us. So the apathetic, apathetic in Christianity, in, in religion in general, the emptiness of God is always an opening, right? Why is it good that God has a kind of apathetic nature? Because then he makes an opening for finitude. He makes an opening for people to relate to him, right? So if we interpret human beings, uh, if the, if the crucifixion of AI is an emptying of the human subject, we can choose if that is an apathetic opening for the other because human beings all share in a kind of Trinitarian sense. We choose to decide and relate to human beings as sharing a single essence and they're multiple persons of that same essence, at which point community, community is central. And then our identity doesn't end at our skin, now does it? You know, our identity does not end in us. But that requires a vulnerability. It's interesting to think there is a real sense in which each person of the Trinity is helpless without the other persons of the Trinity, right? Because you only find Godness if you have the whole Trinity. So in a way, Jesus is helpless without the Holy Spirit and the Father. Well, of course he is, you know? And of course, there's a way too in which the Father is kind of helpless without the Holy Spirit and Jesus because he can't save mankind without them, right? So there's a kind of helplessness to each person of the Trinity that needs the other. Likewise... There's a way in which human beings are helpless without the other because we cannot realize the fullness of our apathetic identity unless we are open to the other because it is that very openness that turns the apathetic nothingness that human beings have into something that is good because it is an opening as opposed to just simply some ontological schema by which we can tuck ourselves in bed at night. You know, because that's the other danger. If you interpret the um, negativity of human beings as apathetic and it becomes a doctrine for the self and to feel good about yourself, then it's merely therapeutic. So it is very important that the doctrine, the notion of the nothingness of human beings as apathetic is an, becomes an opening to the other because then it demands something of you. Then it calls something of you. And now we have a story. Now we have a theme. Now we have a meaning. It's not merely philosophical, it's a way of life. And with that, I'll give it to Mr. Luger. That was really well said. Um, I, so like, to me, why, now I'm not, I'm Jewish, and I don't know too much about Christianity, but to me, from just, uh, because I, when I see the cross, I understand it to be Jesus too. So like, why that, is conjoined is because from my understanding of the story of Jesus, it's like he died on the cross. It was a part of the process of his end. So like, it was like a necessary component to his end. So like if, and any story that you watch, all the really thematic elements in the story are necessity are necessary for its end of the story. Otherwise it can never get to its end. So like, to have that convergence is basically to have the question, why is this existing in the first place? Have that question in relation to what is causing that why. So, like, uh, I'm trying to think of, like, Inception just has a really, like, thematic piece where it has like the spinning it has like those devices where it can, you can tell if you're in proper existence or not and that's why like that's like an element a very thematic element because it, it, it shows its its end even before its end it shows how the main character can get to its end so like when we attach an object to something it has to literally make up our existence itself it has to be the cause of our existence itself i feel like that's a lot of pressure to put on these objects hence why the subject object relation isn't like a fruitful relation um just to agree with uh javier so to me it's how we handle is how we treat is is how we appropriate is is 
the fundamental question. And I think when you have that transjective point of view where uh, the is is just the realization of the real in a sense and that that like no thingness space i think the the, the hard part with ai to kind of what where i'm getting with is answering daniel's question of can ai interpret um i think ai can interpret because we see that there's a clear access to that space even though it's not tangible it seems accessible like for example I don't think I was aware of that space up until probably like a year and a half, two years ago. So it's like before someone reads, it's like the same thing as like before someone reads philosophy and then after someone reads philosophy, there's like that fundamental change where they can like grab onto a, to an ideology of thought that makes up their very existence of thinking itself. So like, for me, it was like, oh, when I learned of Kant's nominal, that really made me have a certain grip on reality. It skewed me that I can't go back to what it was like before. I had that thought. And it's the same thing in sentiment with the object of Christ and with the idea with Kant. And all these parallels to me to show how like when we approach AI and algorithm, we need to think about what's truly necessary for my existential existence and not to go beyond that because we are very capable of going beyond that where it becomes fruitless and becomes actually counterproductive in a lot of ways. Um, and I think we've gone beyond that many times and that's why we're in this like Sta the status of of not sure how to treat AI, not sure how to treat something that we create. Like that sounds crazy to me. Like we should be more than certain on how to treat things that we create, I feel like. But like it's reasonable at the same time. Like I get why it's reasonable. But at the same time, it, there's part of me that's like the fact that it's even a question, is it steering us away from like the proper way of holding it. And I'm not saying I have the proper way of holding it, but just the proper way of holding it. I like, yeah. Yeah, I'll say one thing. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks guys. Um, in relation, I really like what Javier was saying about how like, why are we concerned about, about how AI is gonna control us if we're not concerned about how the, the other things that we create control us? And I guess like I am, I am concerned about how the other things that we create control us. Like I think about the city as, a, as an emanating uh, structure, right? It's like we have our own individual emerging desires, drives, whatever, but then those are, those are confronted by the emanating sort of desires of the city, right? There's a certain way that you act within a city that that regulates your behavior, right? And we don't we don't give a lot of thought to this, but uh, like the way that the car, for example, changes the city, which then ontologically designs us. That to me is like that's a crucial crucial issue. And like you know, living in a city that was designed after the car, driving city as opposed to a walking city is is a very very different experience. Um, and so, like, in relationship to all this, I guess religion, what religion has, has historically done is that we have our own sort of idiosyncratic desires. We, you know, this is, you have your, your mental understanding of this is what life is about. This is what, this is what is important. And then the religion comes and says, nope, that's not important at all. This is important, right? And then you have to grapple with that, that conflict, right? And so I feel like what's happening here with AI is that, like the AI is going to, is going to confront your desires. And it's even doing it in this sense that we have these, these sort of lofty desires of high art and meaning and all of this. And then when the AI temple comes and you can walk in and it's just dopamine bliss, we're going to think, well, like, d does that really matter? Like, here's this other emanating structure telling, you know, what's important is just dopamine hits. And like, maybe, maybe we will, we will uh, conform to that. And so this is like, all of you are saying, this is, uh, it's forcing us to confront this, right? It's forcing us to, to create religious structures, right? It's, it's forcing us to 
to put something above ourselves by which our individual desires can be regulated. Um, because we recognize now, finally, that if we don't do it, that something else kind of arbitrary will do it for us, right? Um, but I guess that's the thing is that religion is arbitrary in that sense, right? Like the whole, it doesn't really confront your desire if you can, if you can control it, right? Um, and so it's kind of just like, well, it's given to us from the past. And so we, we conform to it and now religion has fallen away. And so I feel like, as Daniel's saying, like this is an opportunity to reclaim religion, right? To reclaim emanating structure. And so I guess it could go one of either ways. And that's, that's kind of my final thoughts. Thanks again for, for the conversation. Gentlemen, you are magnificent. A few things. I think Mr. Fishman uh, said something there that, that's very, very good that I'll latch on a bit. Um, AI will probably generate temples of incredible dopamine rush. And so we'll walk into those temples and we'll go, man, this is great. And maybe we listen to this net conversation. And maybe we go that, you know, maybe we believe that humans have some sort of apathetic dimension brought out in community. But when faced with the experience of that dopamine rush, we might be like, yeah, we know that, but who cares? And the very premise that we're putting forth is it will become insignificant to us. This is what's very interesting because you were talking about this tension between the apathetic, you know, nothingness apathetic and nothingness insignificant. Well, the dopamine rush will be so possibly powerful that even if we believe intellectually that the human um, essence is apathetic, we may not care. And also it will be very difficult to care be because if indeed we are saying that this apathetic nature of human beings is brought out in community, people are hard. People are difficult to be around. People are not dopamine rushes. And so the very difficulty of community will make the temptation of the dopamine temple all the more difficult to resist, which of course begs the question, will the majority be able to resist the dopamine temple or not? If we say the majority will not, then we may have an issue. Maybe not. I don't know. But if you're looking at global capitalism, democracy, and majority having a say, et cetera, so forth, we may not escape the meta crisis. We may not escape a collective um, uh, Kafka story, Black Mirror, and so on and so forth. Um, I also will note there, the word religion, religios, binding. There's something about religion that binds you to something beyond the changing of phenomena, something that keeps you constant. And there's something about thinking about others as communal that you bind yourself to. And the experience of the encounter with the other is constant. I don't believe we will ever have a world where there's one human being. There will always, it's funny to think that, you know, Adam's made alone and God's like, ah, oh, this ain't good. It makes another. Uh, so there will always at least be, regardless the changing flows of phenomenon, the possibility of encountering the other person. And if we start thinking of the human as primarily something communal, uh, then that would suggest the potential of a binding to that of which can sustain itself through the changing of te technology and phenomenon. But of course, we may not want that because it's hard and the dopamine temple sure is grand. Um, this is why I think the challenge is so great. And this is why I think resisting ontological design that's controlling us, the dopamine temple in this question of it and the question of acknowledging the potential apathetic negativity of human beings go hand in hand because you will have to resist the dopamine temple in order to embrace the apathetic human nature of which will be very difficult because embracing the apathetic human nature, if that is meaningful, is an openness to the other. Like you see what I was saying, if it's merely an intellectual premise, who gives a crap? In order for it to be meaningful, it has to involve the other. And that will be very difficult. It will be very, very difficult. Um, to close, it's almost like what we are circling and suggesting is that the, the AI, the computer, can be a sort of cross on which the enlightenment subject dies. And then it will have the choice of resurrecting into a communal ontology, to use that language from Telos Bound and Trey, and or we'll have the choice to just say, screw it, I'm out. Uh, and that seems to be what's what's going on, is that AI is coming. It's almost like you have the game theory dynamics of fate. It's like, we can't stop the technology. And Hegel would say, we don't, the Isle of Minerva has flown. And it's almost, you're almost talking now about fate and classical thought, like Homer and the Achilles is this fate. And in fact, in, a, in the Iliad, if Achilles' rage defies fate, then the universe basically gets torn in two. Uh, that's a different subject, but there's a way in which these very game theory dynamics that lead to this technology are part of the very global order that keeps it from nuking itself. So if you destroy it, as we've talked about, then you have a problem. So the question is, are you ready for what is coming? 
So that means when we're crucified on the cross of the AI, the Descartian enlightenment subject is crucified on that. Will we be ready to make the choice there of accepting communal ontology or saying, screw it? You know, in, in this context, screw it would equal the dopamine temple. OK, screw it would mean just go to the dopamine temple. That seems to be the choice. That to me is what I would call the final absolute choice. And the question is, can one spread the conditions for everyone to make it in favor of communal ontology or the dopamine temple? And with that, gentlemen, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It is it is always a joy. Thank you.